Okay, so today we need to discuss Madeline Lickengold's Life Column C. And I've got several notes here, but what I don't want to do is actually just discuss content. You know, I don't want to give you a lecture about content. First of all, you've read it, so you don't need me to summarize it for you. And secondly, that would basically defeat the purpose of having a discussion forum. So instead, I just want to kind of cover some themes and talk about what she's doing in her novel here. So, I guess I really should stop and comment on the author herself for a moment. She was Episcopalian, so it's really not surprising that some of the characters are Episcopalian. And, as I mentioned, you know, in the actual text of our class course, she was very focused on God's mercy and God's forgiveness, and actually she believed in a concept called universal salvation, in which she felt that God would, in his own good time, ultimately save everyone. I mean, that's like the short version of that. So she was very invested in forgiveness and mercy, and that really comes through in this novel. So, a couple things about how the novel's put together. You know, the setting and time, you know, we're going back and forth. So, in the present, we're actually in the 1990s. And you know that simply because the book was copyrighted in the 1990s. That's when she wrote it. And we're flashing back to what is probably the decade of La Ingle's actual life, you know, when she was in college herself, in the 1950s. And she's using the plot device of flashbacks to do this. So, you know, she starts in the 1990s, and Cam is talking to her granddaughter, Raffi. And then she flashes back to her own college years, and we go back to the 50s, and then we flash back forward to the 90s and deal with Raffi a little more, and then go back, and then slowly but surely the novel moves through time. We move through the 50s, we move through the 60s, we probably peek into the 70s, you know, and she places this in time only a little bit, in the sense that she mentions that the Korean War has happened, and that Mac was in it, and then she mentions when JFK was assassinated. So she's not spending a lot of time interacting with the decade so much as she's trying to focus on the characters' relationships with each other. But she does place you. It's not like you have no idea where you are in time. Um, my question to you is, do you find the flashbacks confusing? I've taught this novel before. It's not the novel I always teach, but I've taught it before, and some students are like, I'm fine. Other students are like, actually, I'm really confused by this. I'm never quite sure why I am, and if she, you know, she's come back to the present or not until maybe you should see Raffi's name and go, well, I guess I have to be in the present now. Um, if you're having trouble, there's an actual device in the novel itself. If you're in the present day and the dialogue has normal quotation marks around it, and if you are in the past, the dialogue has single quotation marks. So La Ingle and possibly also the editor for the publishing house figured out a way to give you a visual cue about where you are if the flashbacks are confusing you. All right, we do have two narrators here, which means we have two people's point of view about what's happening. Obviously, we have Camilla, and she's got the bulk of the narration, her thoughts, her feelings, in the third person. But we also have Raffi. We have less of her, but what's interesting is she's the one who's actually driving the plot. You know, which character drives the plot is ultimately the main character, at least in our modern-day conception of how fiction works. So it's interesting that Raffi is driving the plot and is therefore technically the main character, but the person whose narration opens and closes the novel, the person who has the bulk of the novel, is Camilla instead. So, you know, that's a, a question of where you go, I guess that's just innovative or that breaks conventions in a way that I don't like. Which, of course, that's you as a reader. That's your, your take, your personal point of view. All right, different things we have. I think one of the most interesting themes in, in this novel is actually identity. Everyone in this novel, just about, is struggling with identity. Cam struggles with her identity in the past, when you go into the flashbacks. Raffi struggles with her identity. In fact, the final line in this novel is actually a comment on identity. And then Taxi, Taxi literally calls his mom in the first part of the novel and says, um, who am I? So those are the three major ones. You've got some minor characters who are also struggling, like Noel. Noel's not on the page very often, but she is struggling with who she is. And they're not just trying to define who they are as a person. 
they're struggling with who they're going to be when they're married. They're like, okay, these, these are my parents. Is who they are going to impact who I am? And is what their marriage like going to impact what my marriage is like? So it's actually more than one thing that's impacting them. You know, and there's even some discussion in the novel about whether there's a genetic influence. You know, am I tied to my genetics? Am I genetically defined? Um, or do I get to decide for myself and then who am I? So, something you can ask yourself as you're going through this novel is, do I identify with this? Raffi's a college student, and when Cam flashes back, she's also a college student. So, you know, they're kind of in the same place with you there. Do you identify with any of this or not? Trauma. Especially intergenerational trauma. You know, these families are passing traumas forward, and then new traumas also appear along the way, and it impacts everyone in the whole family. You know, family dysfunction has formed around the traumas, and then gets paid forward, unfortunately, generation by generation, until Raffi finally shows up to um, a psychologist, although, you know, in the novel she's called a psychiatrist. But in modern day time, psychiatrists don't counsel patients. They just give you medication. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that she's seeing Raffi like a counselor would when we don't really do that now. Um, I don't know how much experience Lutton Gull actually had going to therapy or how much she knew about psychology, but my other major was psychology and I've actually kept up with it. So I'm like, mm. the psychology in this novel is not necessarily completely realistic or sound. Um, but it's also not a disaster, so it's kind of somewhere in the middle there. But anyway, Raffi shows up and says, okay, I've got to have help now. I'm going to have to have some therapy. I have to sort this out. So Raffi's trying to put a stop to it and actually deal with the trauma. The concept of intergenerational trauma and dysfunction is kind of a big thing. You know, even Disney has now got a movie about it when they created Encanto. They in, open an enormous fandom where people are writing all sorts of articles, blog posts, fan fiction about family dysfunction now. People want to talk about this. They need to talk about this. And this novel is all about this. Um, consequences. This is tied to the trauma. Everyone in the novel makes a series of decisions and those decisions have consequences. And sometimes those consequences are more trauma or more dysfunction. Mac experiences a trauma, and he goes through the first part of his life reacting to the trauma and hurting people with his reaction, especially Cam. Um, obviously, Rose makes a whole series of decisions that impacts everyone in her family, and her husband and daughter, and ultimately son, all experience a great deal of trauma coming from that. So, consequences. Really running through this novel, um, in a very powerful way. Forgiveness and mercy, as I said at the start. So, to me this is the most interesting part of the novel. You know, she has a quote, Olivia gives you the quote, that, you know, everything that we do is nothing more than a live coal in the sea of God's mercy. And I was just going to put it right out, because God is so merciful. But the characters are struggling much more than that, obviously. Struggling to have mercy, struggling to forgive. Is there enough mercy? Is there enough forgiveness in their heart to handle the trauma they've actually experienced? That's a real question in this novel. Um, I think one of the most fascinating scenes in the early part of the novel is the one where Olivia is talking to Cam and says, you know, I use the fine china every day, but as a result it's chipped. And then she later says, I mean, there are cracks, you know, some of these pieces have been broken, the, the pot got burned through the bottom and then I mended it and I kept using it, and maybe two were too quick to throw away things that just need to be mended or, or something cracked or chipped, and, you know, it's a real commentary, it's a really good metaphor for what they're trying to talk about as characters, and, you know, this theme in the novel, you're going to show the cracks, you're going to be chipped. But she chooses to put the best part forward. She puts out the fine china every day instead of saving it for Christmas Eve or whatever, Thanksgiving. She puts it out every day. She lets it get cracked. She lets it get chipped. It's been lived in, if you will. And I always thought, from the very first time I read this novel when I was in college, I thought, that's really powerful. 
That's a really powerful way of looking at life and how you're going to deal with your relationships. Are they going to feel lived in? Well, if so, they're going to be chips and cracks. You know, and is that crack too severe? Are you not going to be able to glue this back together? Or can you make, can you make it if you just work together and move forward? And the characters who make it do have to work together and move forward. It can't be one-sided. There's no such thing as a one-sided relationship. Psychology will tell you that right away. It has to be both partners or it doesn't work. And I think the different characters in this novel actually show that really well. Um, so I would say as you go into the second part of the novel, keep your eye on the forgiveness aspect. You know, people often misrepresent forgiveness. And I think the better interpretation I've heard is letting go of something so that it doesn't keep eating you up and keep you tied to the person that hurt you. And again, I think these characters actually show different levels of forgiveness there and what it ends up meaning to them all the way through the end of the novel. So, as I said, as you finish out the novel, just keep your eye on that scene.